Thank you. Maybe an obvious place to start, but let's talk about um, the guitar. Your your history with the guitar and the, your love of the guitar, and I, I think also if you could bring in the, in, the, in your reply something about the playing the rhythm guitar, and because that's where you really started. And, you know, I think Tony talked quite a bit about that how it really works so well with with him in the development of the song. It's about ten questions there. Yeah. Okay. So well, you have to remember, actually, you know, I often get asked, or used to get asked about, like, you know, why did you use the guitar rather than keyboards? Well, you've got to imagine that the era when I started playing guitar, the Beatles and the Stones and the Who, there were no keyboards around, you know, bar Alan Price. So never on my radar playing keyboards. Um, and uh, it was the instrument of the time, I suppose, in a way, and of that kind of era, I, th I think. Um, I started guitar about seven or eight at school, prep school, and I formed the Chesters, a school band, of which, a five-piece band of which only two played instruments. That's how it worked in those days. Um, and then... Um, what did the others do? <laughs> they were still in the band. Not you could say you were in a band, that's all that mattered, really. Didn't have to play an instrument. Um, and then... Um, yeah, I mean, I was a very slow learner with the guitar. Just, just, just. Uh, then I went to prep public school and met Ant Phillips, who was a very fine guitarist, much further down the road than me. And then, once we decided to become a band and play our own songs, obviously you had to have more a bass player as well. So obviously it was a natural choice for me to play bass and rhythm guitar because uh, Ant was much better lead guitarist. I didn't really play lead. And to be honest, until Steve left, I didn't play lead because there was no call for it. But in a sense, my sort of rhythm guitar stuff is really what I wrote on. And that's part of the basis of some of the sort of Genesis instrumental sections. Very often you'd have a kind of riff or a groove or something I set up on the guitar, which turned Tony with solo over, really. Was it seen as a, was it a kind of symbol of rebellion to you in a way? I know, I know it got, it got banned in the end. Well, I feel like I'm quoting my book now. My housemaster, Kenneth Char, who hated me, felt there was about to be a revolution in the school, started by me, caused by my guitar. So I was banned from playing guitar most of the time at school, which of course is why you want to play guitar. Probably why I'm a guitarist, actually. Anything banned is suddenly um, attractive. Uh, but it was seen, you know, you have to understand that kind of the era of the 60s. There was a new music form coming in and this big social cultural change that took place because uh, until the 60s, young men, this is it's a big moment which we tied into, I think, you know, our, our musical era. Until the 60s, young men wanted to become their fathers. Age 20 or 19, become the, you know, wear the same clothes, do the same thing, and then suddenly in the 60s, anything but their fathers. And that's where it kind of, it started really. And so long hair was seen as shocking and, and guitars were seen as shocking and pop music was shocking. And you see photographs now of the Stones, you know, the hair's just about here. At the time it was like, oh my God, you know, rebels. Um, so it was, um, Interesting, you know, in a sense, the music was part of the social and cultural change that was going on. Uh, the the um, formation of your early bands at school, um, you went through the phase with working with Ant and then meeting up with Tony and Peter. Was, do you recall a kind of gradual maturing during that process to the point where you felt you could play a decent tune and could play properly? Well, in fact, I mean, to be honest, it wasn't until the first album that you really needed to play very well because we were just writing songs in the classroom in the afternoon. And so it wasn't so much about performing on your instrument. It wasn't until the first album with Jonathan King, done on the holidays, the summer holidays, that <clears throat> you then realised that actually you need to play your instrument better than you did. In my case, you know, my guitar playing was, was adequate and my bass playing was pretty shabby. You hadn't played the songs live, you know, we were just writing songs. So suddenly, that first album and then the, the period after The Cottage 
was really where you go from being barely off the starting block to becoming something that had to, had to work. Just give us a, a sense of when you teamed up with Jonathan King, um, he was a, a successful young guy in the music industry and, and a man who had already had a hit. What did this feel like and was, it, was there a sense in which, right, we're going to write hit, hit songs, pop songs? Well, it wasn't even, there was no plan. Never has been really, but it definitely wasn't then. You know, and a friend of ours, John Alexander, a school friend, John Alexander, put the tape in, in King's car. I think I'd left school by then, because I think, I think it must have been, I left a year earlier, I think, than, than Peter did. Actually, I'm not sure, I get muddled. Anyway, he went in his car on a sort of, you know, old, old Carthusian's day, and he liked it. <clears throat> and saw us and saw Peter and, and liked Peter's voice and offered to make an album with us. Now, that was a very important time. You know, nowadays anyone can make an album or a record at home you know, on their laptops. You know, in those days, to get in a studio, age 16, barely 17, you know, pretty unskilled in many ways, and be given three whole days to make an album. It seems crazy now, but in those days, that was a long time to make an album. It was very important to us, I think, actually. Um, and I think without that, it may never happen because it kind of it made us glimpse of what could be done. It gave us an excitement about where we could be going. And I think it's... Uh, and so, come the album, you then realise that you hadn't really played together much. You hadn't become a band. We weren't a band, we were just songwriters. Um, and the first album was led much more by... Well, was led by Tony and Peter. Their songs are really what it was based on. <coughs> Whereas Trespass, I think it was much a lot more to do with uh, Anne to myself, or more to do with Anne to myself. Genesis to Revelation uh, actually isn't a bad album. I mean, there's some quite good songs on there. Right? But when you get to Trespass, there's a huge, it's a sea change in the, in the way that uh, the, 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 the kind of complexity of the, of the music, you know. Well, I think, you know, I think, you know, it's these things happen in your career which come, turn out right. You look back and you think how important it was, you know, to have that six months in the cottage away from London, away from other bands, away from other live shows, gave us that time just to sort of play together and learn and discover what we're going to become. You know, we were like a, we were, it's like a blank canvas. We had song ideas and we had lyrical ideas and we had music ideas, but no real platform to work from, no real technical pattern. And so in that time, on our own devices, we sort of basically learnt to see what we were going to work at. How important uh, was Ant in, the, in that first phase? Well, I mean, I think Ant, Ant is, is rather forgotten in history. The move to the cottage really was to do with him, I think. He was determined to be a musician, and Peter was at film school, Tony at university. I had a chance to go to Edinburgh, but I took time off to do this. And so we were a little bit undecided, but Ant was decided. And I think he was... Uh, his drive was very important to us. It was, it was a group, there was no designated leader, but in a sense, was he... <coughs> no, I wouldn't say that, because um, the minute you've got, you're writing on guitar and keyboards, there's different sounds. No, I wouldn't say he's the leader, but I think his, his energy got us to the cottage. Without that, we would never have done it. Um, and that at the cottage, people developed some of their characters, like, you know, Peter, because he wasn't playing piano, because that was Tony's territory. In the book, I give hard, Tony a hard time, which I think upset him a bit how, you know, because in a way, think about it, I hadn't really realised until I read some articles that, in fact, you see, Pete would play piano until then, but in the cottage, Tony was a keyboard player, so Pete wasn't really giving much time on the keyboard, so he had time on his hands. Whereas we would jam and try and get ideas going, Apart from lyrical ideas and vocal ideas, he had some time on his hands, so he used that to sort of start becoming, not the manager, but the outside link. He'd ring up the agents, he'd ring up the managers, he'd, he'd promote the band a bit. Did the, um, the Trespass album, um, after the failure of Genesis to Revelation, I suppose you could say it was a failure. <laughs> you definitely could say it was a failure. <laughs> 
<coughs> Trespass album kind of give you a little bit of hope, a bit of confidence. Um, there, there was something a lot, a lot more solid there. Well, I think, you know, Genesis Revelation was a summer holiday project. Trespass, we felt we were part of the music business. We were, we were actually involved in the music world. You know, record label, a studio. We felt professional. And the album, I think, uh, is the one album we've ever done that was played live before we recorded it. So all the songs have been played live quite a lot, which did mean, on reflection, it meant that actually you were locked into your parts. Whereas since then, we've written, out, written songs, recorded them first. So when you record them, you're not tied to a part, you're open to ideas. But this one, the songs were all locked into how, how they were, but it doesn't mean it didn't have another sort of strength because of that. And then um, Ant leaves. Um, did that seem like a, a, a very uh, disastrous moment then? Yeah, I remember driving out with, with Richard McPhail who said, can we have a word with you? And I thought, oi, oi, to the pitch at Richmond rugby ground after the sound check. Kind of light was falling, it was a weird atmosphere. And Anne said he wanted to leave, you know. Um, huge shock to me. And I think, looking back now, I think, well, I think, why didn't we sort of just go, hang on a minute, discuss it? He'd been ill, glandular fever was finding stage fright and stage nerves. Why don't we sort of discuss it and make a plan? But then again, we just got a little bit of, bite, a little bit of a bite. We we're just slightly off and running, up and running. And I think we probably thought it may be incorrect too. You know, six months off, three months off, we might have just lost any chance we had to get going. But it does seem strange on reflection that we didn't actually talk about it. I mean, you, you were very young, pretty inexperienced. Uh, you know, sharing maybe emotions or deep, deep uh, di distress wasn't probably no. part of the deal. No, we didn't do for the next 25 years, really. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, that's what it was, you know, and it was, yeah, it was a shock. So in a way, in a way when Peter left, shocking though it was, we got through Ant's one, which at the time seemed insurmountable. Um, um, and so we, we, we carried on, really. Let, let's just go into the Supper's Ready, uh, which I think you've, you've said that Supper's Ready is probably, uh, you know, perhaps your favourite from that period, that yeah. first few years. Do you want to talk about that and t tell us why? The one thing about Supper's Ready, which is interesting, is it kind of happened, it kind of fell into place. We didn't sit down and say we're going to write a song this long, but it worked, you know, that's that's been part of our sort of pattern, really. And then the instrumental section at the end, which became a big part of, our, uh, of the song, kind of happened one day when we just, it wasn't a plan, just jamming around in 9-8, and I had a riff, dun, 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 you know, and Phil was drumming around the rhythm and across it, and Tony started playing. And then the end section, when Peter came back with the vocals, um, one of those rare moments when you, you we had no idea what, what was gonna go on there. Was it instrumental, was it vocals? It wasn't, we weren't sure, really. And he came in and sang this incredibly powerful line, 666 in the end section. And actually, it kind of happened before you knew it. Whereas some music sections are a bit laboured. You've got to work at it and push it. This one just sort of seemed to actually just become a wonderful piece without too much effort. The thing that, that's very striking about it is that there's a kind of emotional content, emotional depth to it, uh, which means that it does have this sort of power. Kind of it, I feel it's like everyone in the band is at their best. Instrumentally, some of the playing, some of the music, the sections Willow Farm, which is very much Peter's section, you know, and then some of the other sections, which is more myself and Tony. I think all the best bits of what we were doing at that time were in that song. And it, uh, it's luck too. It held together. You never quite know. You joined things up, you know. When you recorded that, um, when you put it together, uh, am I right that you didn't, you didn't really, at the, at the point you were playing and, and developing it, you didn't really have a sense of how all these bits fitted together? No, not at all. It wasn't until we finally put it all together, realised that one section was not quite in the same key. We had to sort of cheat a bit, you know. It was in the days of tuning, so they went, didn't quite line up. They weren't quite in key, so 
semi turn out. Um, <clears throat> yeah, but I mean, I, I, I'm a big believer in, in luck. Something just happened, you know, it's just luck and meant to be. And, and since then, all some of the best songs you've written just happened easily. The fact that it's like 22, 23 minutes long, um, you know, you'd think that was a fairly adventurous thing to be doing. Um, but it, it, you weren't daunted by that. I mean, there was no sense in which, hang on, you know, we've got to contain this and keep it down to sort of seven or eight minutes. There was a funny, there were two worlds. There was Singles World, the kind of pop band, sort of Mud and Piggity Witch and, you know, and that lot. Um, and there was the album bands and they weren't in the same area at all. So you weren't worrying about length of song. There were no constraints, which is nice. And also the other thing is, that, I mean, I said it before, but you know, we, no one ever said to us, can we hear what's going on? It was from record labels, you know, we'd handed me album and that was it. Um, I see so many bands now being, you know, <coughs> A&R guys going in and listening and giving that two penny worth and it, it's tough. I mean, maybe valid sometimes, but we, we had enough, enough ideas within us to not ever want that. If you take that, um, that sort of period where you, you said you were all do, playing at your best, um, how would you characterize... Well, I actually meant that, I meant that song. You know, that song is an example of where all the bits we were doing all worked well. In the sense that, the, 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 that you gelled as a, as a team, as a group, we're all, all contributing equally, I would imagine, at that point. Yeah, I mean, it always, it bits vary, always vary, but um, it's never good to go back and say who did what, because, you know, sometimes some sections are much more one person than another, um, and that's, that's fair too, you know. That's the way it goes, really. And how, how would you, just talk about the individuals a, a little bit, how would you characterise uh, the contributions? I mean, take Phil as an example. Yeah, I mean, he wasn't writing music per se at this stage, but his, his, his input was like, for example, the, the, the 9 8 section, instrumental section, which is a big part of the song, I think, actually, leading to the end, was, was um, a jam, you know? And since drum machines, we all play in 4-4, four, four, it's dangerous. In those days, you could play around. I think it's in 9 8, but you played around it nicely, you know what I mean? It's sort of, um, so you never quite settled on, onto where you were, which I liked. Um, and then Tony had this long solo, which is once again adventurous. Um, and uh, but Peter himself, I'm trying to think, uh, he's he comes in with, as you said, he sort of suddenly there's there's the arrival of this line or two lines of lyric. Um, was that something that you? Was, was anticipated when you were, you were playing it. Well, Peter always caught the mood, but I think what, what always works is that you have to create a mood that's very special. Like the opening section has this eerie feel to it. And suddenly you're in a setting, you know, and it means you're going to lyrically, and lyrically and musically, melodically, you have to be in a certain area that marries that, you know. The different stages that Peter went through from initially in live, and kept playing live, from, um, you know, being the, being the singer without a lot of props to the, the, the stage being quite theatrical and having all, all the masks and so on. Was that a relatively short period of time and how much did he kind of discuss this beforehand and lead you into it? Well, Pete, very sensibly, didn't discuss it at all with us actually because we'd have probably said, are you sure? Um, see, interesting point is what, what people forget is that because these things are talked about, and the pictures of people with the bat wings. They're high points in the set, but they're only a fairly small part of the set. They kind of forget that, you know what I mean? It makes it sound like the whole evening was musical, and he was always wearing clothes, and, but Bar the Lamb, which is different, it was just a, a kind of pinnacle at certain moments, like the old man in the musical box. The whole set wasn't like that. Most of it was just people playing and singing and banging his bass drum, you know, it's sort of, people tend to think of it as more theatrical than it was. Until the lamb. What was the impetus for doing this with, with him? I mean, what was it? Because he was, there was a lot of hanging about between, you know, whilst you guys were playing. Well, that's the chat. That's what got going with the chat. That's why he started doing such such good chat, really. But no, I mean, I think the 
the concept originally was partly, of, I remember, was that you couldn't hear the words in those days because the PA was so crap. Little column speakers, you know, either side of the stage. And so the first thing was the old man, really, and I think that just he's act, acting out the part of the lyrics. And visually, it's very exciting. I mean, it was a great musical section, and I think his performance really enhanced it. It's, it's telling the stories, really. Remember the first time that uh, he came on as the old man? No, nope, I mean, no, not at all. I mean, but no one does really. We see, uh, no, but sometime it was around. You know, it was obviously around that album time. So I don't remember. First show, I can't remember when it was, but it's sort of. Um, but my point is, I want to get across is that you know people because these have been such highly points. You've seen pictures of all these things. They seem like that was the whole show. It was, it was part of the show and a, a great part, you know. Or looking back, as history, history goes on, you, you end up, there, there are hype, there are, there are points you remember a certain album, an era or a tour, and there'd be those moments, you know, the Bat Wings or the Old Man, and they forget the show's an hour and three quarters maybe, and that's probably 15 minutes of the whole thing, you know. It's the sort of photo op moment. Well, but I'm saying it's how you remember these things, you know what I mean? And I think it's a bit like, I've said before, later on the albums when we started having hit singles, you know, and so, in a sense, those big hits overshadowed, just in terms of media, an album. Um, so their perception was the album's just hit singles, you know. Yeah, which is totally fine. Uh, which is fine, but well, you know, albums like Visible Touch had uh, Domino on it, which is a, I think so, was it Domino? Yeah, great live song, 15 minutes-ish. And then uh, the one with Mum on it had Home by the Sea, you know, so, but, People see it through the press, really, in many ways. This whole idea that if you love the early Genesis, you're not a fan of yeah. the later Genesis. Um, my sense is that, uh, you know, that, that the whole arc of your career, there's a, there's a continuity of sound which underpins the whole thing. Um, well, I would agree, but I mean, I think I have to accept that if you started off on a certain album <coughs> in the Peter area, That'll be your favourite era, probably always, which is how it is. The first album you'd like a band for is probably always a favourite album. Um, and I understand that. But I mean, I agree, you know, I, I don't see such a huge change as, as it's talked about in a sense. But then again, I suppose it has been, in a way, lyrically, it's almost a bigger change from the sort of Peter era and the kind of darker stories and the more folky mythology type things that Tony and I used to write. That's probably a big change from that to <coughs> um, later on. Those folky mythology things. Um, where the, what, what were you trying to do at that point? I mean, uh, were you trying to be folk musicians more than anything, or were you trying to push the envelope on the folk side? Trying to be edgier folk. You don't have a plan. You know what I mean? You d you're not ever thinking, let's do this, because you just sort of do what you don't be different. Um, I mean, as be, I'm sure everyone's told us you that, you know, when asked about our influences, we always say the Beatles and Motown, which we all share, but you can't hear that, obviously, in the song, but it is there somewhere, you know. Um, well, Motown is a bit of a sort of soul. Yeah. If you're drawing a canvas now, it'd be full up of everything. But in those days, there was sort of a couple of bands like that. There was bits of white in between the bands, you know, that you could, you could there was room to sort of, define what you're going to become. It wasn't so obvious what was out there. Yeah, I mean, you'd go to a festival in the early 70s and there'd be a huge range of potential performers, you know. Well, before that, I mean, I remember seeing, I went to the, what's it, the Rainbow, it would have been the Rainbow, I think. Um, and the bill was Jimi Hendrix, Engelbert Humperdinck, the Walker Brothers, Someone called the Californians, whoever they were. So, but you know, just Hendrix and Engelbert on the same bill. That's the way it worked then. It was pop music. You know, there weren't such defined categories now. In your uh, book, you described being in America on the, I think it was Steve Miller show. Steve Miller, great, great musician. Um, but on came Peter with um, the shaved look on, the, on his head. And there was a kind of a, a shock ran, ran through the audience. Is that right? Would you like to tell that story? Well, it's more that you can see Steve Miller, who is a great guitarist, and he's a kind of, it's kind of blues, really. 
and great songs. <clears throat> you could see him looking at us and thinking, I think we do Watchers of the Sky. You could see him thinking, what the fuck is this? You know what I mean? It's just he couldn't get it at all, you know. Nor he would, because it's so, so bizarre, you know, from... And I think that very English folky thing in America was perceived as something very exciting, you know. It was just so unlike Americans, what was going on. And that kind of sound we were making in America, it was so different to... that. They were all full of boogie and, 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 and rock and roll and kind of blue stuff. So our sound was unique to them. It's kind of why it worked in America, I think. It was just a completely new... Um, foreign platform of music, really. How do, how do you, I mean, looking back now, how do you see the, the, the sort of development of the American audience? Because you, if you go there with that English folky sound, edgy or folky, um, by 74, 75, you've got um, Lamb, which is, has an American subject. It is much more rock, rock sounding, harder, um, did, did people buy into that when they heard it first? Because you, you, there was no record out, was there? Funnily enough, it worked. I think we had, well, we had you know, we, at that stage, we were a large cult band. So they were coming to see you because they were like, they liked you. They were part of you, you they were new, you know, they were sort of part of your fans. It wasn't so much casual people. I guess brought in by, you know, word of mouth, but it was, um, they wanted to like us, but it was uh, quite testing, actually. But the show still worked. So in the initial performances in America of, of Lamb, was there a kind of um, uh, curiosity? <coughs> well, no, I think, I mean, it was so different. I think it opened in Chicago, I remember, actually. I think for the public, it was amazing. They hadn't been quite like it before, you know. Uh, visually, it was, just, it was just adventurous, really. Kind of a bit theatreish, and I think, in a sense, that's that's probably why you always thought maybe there might be some sort of theatrical way of performing it. At some stage, you know, in this, it hasn't been done yet, and it may never be done. But I feel it could become a theatre piece, maybe not even like London theatres, maybe a sort of touring theatre piece, you know. But who knows? In writing the man, um, I know that this. You know, there were a lot of problems, obviously, in, in getting that down. Um, uh, Tony Smith actually talked to, about how that, that this was a very tough thing to kind of get get through and get out and get on the road with. Um, what, what was your experience of it? Um, well, the house Hedley Grange, which, which was Zeppelin's house, we rented off them. Um, it was a funky old place, but it was a nice, nice atmosphere, a big sort of front living room you, you recorded and, well, wrote in, really. Um, <clears throat> first of all, double album is more work than you thought. It gave us more time, some of the sort of interesting little jams we had, you know, between the songs and stuff. Um, but I think really kind of overshadowed by kind of Pete leaving in the middle for that William Freakin thing, you know, which is... I can understand always, and there's a slightly strange feeling when one of the one of the one of the sort of guys you're working with isn't as keen as you are. It makes you feel a little less. It slightly dampens it a bit. And if all five of you are, we're five then are kind of into it and excited about it. You know, in the morning, it, it, it's a nice feeling, and the chat in between. You know, it's a sort of team thing. You 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 feel off it. But if one person is not so sure about wanting to be there. It does rather damp, it, it did dampen the atmosphere a bit, but then he sort of left for a bit and then I think William Freakin thought, hang on, I don't want to break the band up, you know, and it never quite came to, 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 to fruition and he came back and we finished it off, but it, it made it funny all round, really. Can you recall when Peter first discussed the Lamb ideas? Was there a kind of group decision that, okay, we're going to be doing this American subject, uh, double album, concept album, something very We'd agree to double album. I mean, we'd agree to concept album. And I always feel it's part of Pete's decision when he, one of the reasons why he actually moved on after that, because having done a whole album of lyrical ideas like that, to go back to doing a single album and maybe sharing the lyrics is a different, almost a step back, really. Peter's career, then became a series of solo albums, um, and he's 
very much known as a solo artist. Whereas you guys, you're still working with with other people. You, you, it's like well, you must realise, you know, in order to be a solo artist, you have to be a singer. Without that, it's a bit tough, as I found out. Um, and so, but also I did a couple of solo albums, one with another vocalist and one with me singing, which I'll never do again, because you write a good song, you want a great voice. Mm -hmm. And that great voice isn't me, without doubt. <coughs> I mean, over the years, Banks and I kind of, the interaction of playing together, the chordal stuff and his lines over it, and the, uh, is, an, is a very exciting thing, you know, we'll go into a jam session maybe, you know, and it's a bit like playing tennis. I make a noise and he reacts to my noise. I react to his noise, then it comes back to me. Then Phil was drumming or singing, so that, that's part of the equation, but the kind of, the middle, the middle part of the sound, the chords, which creates the atmosphere in some ways, and some of the moods, has always been very much Tony in my role, and we sort of, we kind of do it together, I think. But it's very, it's very improvised, it's very freeform, it's very creative. And on my own, there's no one to play against. That's how I view it. You know, there's no, if I play a chord, there's not something over there. It's a bit, I'm stuck, you know, I get no, I feed off a reaction. Mm -hmm. I need to have that kind of um, churning of sound and messing of ideas, sort of melting pot of ideas, and then you react, which is why, you know, the mechanics has been great to, to co-write with. There's an interesting um, point that Tony raised. Um, look, I, I think you said that Tony... Which Tony? Uh, uh, Tony Banks. You said that Tony Banks could, 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 would never be able to write a hit record. And um, uh, His response to, to that, I think, was to say, <laughs> you know, you're probably right, actually. I mean, initially he sort of said, well, I don't know, but, but he said, you're probably right. He said it himself. He's a great carry on. Yeah, okay. Go on, yes, yeah. So, well, the, the inter but then he came back and said, I don't. You know, the, Mike Mike writes great songs, you know, "Follow You, Follow Me," etc. Hits, and yet when he's with his own band, he doesn't do the writing, uh, and Tony doesn't understand that. And why, why? Lyrically, very simply, I, I started off in the mechanics with Chris Neal and B. A. Robertson. A song like um, "All You Need Is a Miracle," it's also sort of second hit. You know, I've got I've got the chorus line. I write the words of the chorus, but I get lazy, and I've got other stuff. I've got other stuff to worry about: getting the drums right, getting the sound right. Um, and so Chris sort of, I gave him the chorus lyric, you know, and, he, and, and, and the first vocal verse line, and he did the rest. So in a sense, another cup of coffee. I had this line, you know, she pours herself another cup of coffee, and that sort of that set the mood for the song. But he wrote the rest of it. Um, my brain is busy somewhere else. And also, on top of that, B.A. Robertson, who I co-wrote with, is such a strong lyricist. Um, I kind of let, let him go, really. I mean, you know, I mean I, I'll be involved in that age, and we do them together. But I think um, there was such strength there. And once again, you know, you're, you're worrying about other stuff. You know, in Genesis, I'm worrying about the guitar and maybe the words in the song. I'm not worried about the keyboards or the drums. I know that Tony and Phil will do a great job on that. No, listen and comment, but I mean, I know they've got, got that covered. Whereas on a solo album, you've got no one doing quite the same role. So you're, you're, you've got less time to do stuff. And I must admit, I, sort of, I do think it's weird. I kind of, I've rather lost the habit of writing words. Atlanta Confusion is a song I'm proud of, the words for that. But I need to sort of, I might try and address it a bit because I don't tend to write and sing anymore. That's where some of the words come, you know, so I should do, but uh, back to Tony Banks and his hit singles. He kind of knows I'm right, actually. He could get lucky, but he just can't, hasn't got the same sort of, not, I don't mean feel for words, he's got a feel for words, hasn't got the same ear. But that's his strength too, really. Yeah, he may, he, he may well say, which I think he has said, which, OK, I'm not, I'm not aiming to write hit singles as such. I'm trying to do something a little more kind of complicated. That's his defence. No, no, no one tries to write a hit single. You don't try and do it, but sometimes you have to have a sort of 
a certain, it's not commercial, a certain repetition. Uh, catchiness, I mean, that sounds a corny phrase, but a certain sort of simplicity. That's the way to put it. Um, and of course, I'm very conscious now what Tony Banks thinks, because having done this book, right, which I didn't show him until I finished it, <coughs> um, I, the first, have you spoken to Tony yet? Yeah. The first half, I think slightly upset him a bit. And the trouble is, now, I was trying to be careful, when you, when you write, I write, when I write about Tony, you know, you're writing it from a point of view of sort of with, with a love and a warmth, because that's how you feel. But when you read it on paper, if you're not quite feeling that, um, some of my digs, or which are meant to be, I'd say it in front of you, anyone here, and I'd say, you know, anyone I've never met before, I'd wind him up and tease him, but when you put it in a book, it can maybe look, a couple of things can look a little bit uncomplimentary, but um, he can reply with his book. No, it, it, it was fine, but I hadn't quite realised. You know, you're saying things with a with a feeling of sort of warmth and love, and, and, and so to you, when you write them and say them, they have a different uh, atmosphere to them. Yeah, I, I, I think he's uh, he's he's got he's got past it. Now. Oh no, he got past it within five minutes. That's the best thing actually. It took about five minutes to have a little rant, and then then. We carried on, but um, uh, we'll see. Now, t talking about um, s songwriting and uh, lyric writing, um, Phil, um, did it surprise you when Phil started writing songs that became, well, first of all, started writing songs full stop? Um, well, not really. Not, it didn't really surprise me. I hadn't really thought about it. I was worried about me, you know. Uh, no, I hadn't really thought about it. I mean, but. It seemed a very natural thing. I mean, Phil's got a very intuitive way of seeing music. It's sort of, it's a, it's never awkward. You know, Tony and I sometimes write things. We're trying to be perhaps too brave sometimes. And when it works, it's very strong. When it fails, it's not so strong. It's not great sometimes. But that, that, that's the route, route we take, whereas Phil, It'll always be how he once wanted to be, you know, it's always intuitive and it sort of sits right. And so his first, his solo album, <coughs> um, yeah, I mean, I heard in the air, so that was fantastic. Um, and it's worth mentioning, and I think I might have mentioned before, actually, once again, luck. You know, I think, had we not been mid-album, Abacab recording in the studio, writing stuff, playing with Hugh Padgham, enjoying it, had we not been in that mode, I, and that Phil's album came out and just took off, it might have been different, you know. Um, as it was, it, it surprised him as much as us, I think, you know, and it was great, but we were sort of already geared up to the next project, so it sort of, it was good timing in a sense. Um, so, no, not surprised really, but um, it's interesting how well he did without Tony and I looking at every shoulder and <laughs> saying, no, don't do that. It's interesting. The freedom to do how he wanted it, you know. Yeah, he's t uh, Phil's talked about the, the freedom side of it. It was like, you know, n now you're the, now, now you're fully in charge, it's your solo album. Um, well, the, Tony and I are slightly, I say, I use the word chord snobs, but I just mean, you know, something too simple sometimes. He doesn't trust Tony, he feels he's not good enough, you know, but, and, and, I'm generalising here, <clears throat> and so, uh, but in a way, Phil's simplicity was part of the strength, really. The fact that you kept, <coughs> uh, that, that Phil, you know, Phil, Phil could do that and then come back, join up with you guys again, and uh, as you said, uh, partly coincidence because you were in the middle of that cabin. Well, it, it did help, yeah. I mean, I, I do claim actually that you know. We are unique in the fact that, like, I think any other band who's done this solo main band career and run it for many years afterwards, you know. And I'm sure everyone said to you, the reason is because the solo stuff was not caused by dissatisfaction. It was caused by a desire to maybe just explore a wider musical context, really. You know, that the idea you stay in one band forever is slightly odd, really. Look at the jazz world and the folk world, they sort of intermix and 
intermarry, so to speak, whereas, you know, the, the rock world was a bit like... <clears throat> and even in those days, they'd say, you know, um, oh, you reformed the band, you know. I always feel that... I mean, we always felt that whatever we are doing is the main thing at the time, the band or solo, but it wasn't like, if you're doing that, you can't do that, you know. And I'm sure it helped us keep going, actually. The variety of, of work and, 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 and music was, I think, gave us a freshness as a main band. So when you first started your first solo album, um, was that point where Phil had sort of said, look, I've got to go off? Yeah, Phil had done that. By now we listened. By now we sort of, we grew up a bit. You know, Tony and I were a bit more grown up. And so we said, unlike when, when Peter wanted to, Peter left, you know, and Ant left, there was no discussion. So we said, OK, well, I think our career got to a certain level you felt you could stop for a bit. We said, OK, well, you go to Canada and, and sort it out and, and we'll deal with it from there. Because I was very aware that if you want to be in a band, things like location and other people's lives is not a reason not to do it. You can find a way to make it work if you want to be in the band together, if you want to carry it on. <clears throat> and so um, we had time suddenly. Off I went. Did you have Small Creeps Day? Yeah, Small Creeps Day. Sorry to uh, interrupt you. Did, but I was going to ask you, did you have the idea in your head? Had you been storing it up for some time? No. I mean, I read the book and enjoyed the book about the factory, um, this, this factory process when you compare life to a factory floor <clears throat> and, the, and the machine, the factory production, the machine goes through this different, different sections, you know different parts of the workshop. Um, uh, now I thought, okay, what am I going to do? Once again, you know, a bit of a blank canvas is quite nice. You know, who's going to drum? Who's going to? And so Simon Phillips, who I loved his drumming, came on board, you know, and just suddenly had a chance to do something you couldn't normally do within the band. And that was, that was a freshness again, you see. Maybe the reason we've lasted so long is, is that over all that time period, there have been changes, you know. Ant left, Peter left, Steve left, sort of stuff. That's four, four, you know, big events in a long career, which suddenly bring a freshness to the, the mothership. Um, Ant uh, leaving seemed like a, a, an absolute disaster, you were saying. But gradually these... Um, we haven't talked about um, Steve leaving. Um, Steve <coughs> had become a f pretty much a fully fledged member of Genesis, yeah. but there was a strange kind of um, leaving period, wasn't there? Was it? Well, it's in the book. I sort of, I sort of looking back, I kind of think, I don't quite know why he left. Really, he didn't have to leave. You know, he could have stayed. It would have carried on. Um, it's his choice. You know, but I, I feel he, and the way he left is kind of odd too. He just didn't turn up one day. You know which was kind of slightly strange. Um, we just sort of carried on a bit like, oh, he's not coming. We were mixing a live album, I think, or something. I think it was a live album we were mixing. We just sort of carried on, you know. Um, I suppose what it was, he, he wanted to do solo work at a point when I think we felt the band hadn't established itself enough to be able to then take a hiatus a year off. And I think, actually, I think we were correct in that. Had we all stopped then, um, it would have been hard, I think, to kind of recreate the energy, <clears throat> you know, with the fans and stuff, you know. Um, and his first solo album, I enjoyed it. I should play on it. I enjoyed it. Um, but I think it was, it was looking back, I'm not quite sure why we didn't have a chat. Why didn't he say, listen, guys, um, I'm a join the band, I want to do this. Can we work it out, you know? Um, I know he felt frustrated by the amount of his music that got on the album. Um, and I understand that, absolutely, really. But at the same time, I think, I do feel, and this is in, in a funny way, myself and Tony have been writing for a long time, uh, you know, since we were sort of 14, 15. And I think we were sort of further down that path. What Steve wrote was great. But I think he wanted to be able to sort of say, well, 
we're a four piece now and I want I want to have an equal share of the songs and I think that that that's hard to do um, because you can't if they're good you want them in you know but you can't really sort of say it like that and I think he felt probably a little bit hard done by in a sense I think Tony and I shouted louder probably um, but um, yeah, it seems looking back, it seems strange. It, it, it didn't really have happened. I don't know why he's the most original guitarist, but he, he did. And so we sort of we, we 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 then thought about getting someone else in. But I think we felt that the three of us had gone. We were so close at that point in time. Such a good good working unit that to bring a new new person in, I mean, it could have worked, you know. But it wasn't quite so. It wasn't imperative. And so I, I mean, I hadn't played much lead guitar, so I thought, well. I can probably do enough for the next two albums, you know, and I sort of... And I'm still not a great solo player, but I could do enough. A lot of the Genesis songs are written on, on rhythm guitars. Riffs are my sort of parts, you know. That's what I gave to the song, so in a sense we sort of we carried on, it was fine. I think Tony um, talked about when you were in the studio, and I think... I don't know if Steve had left at this point or whether he was off doing his solo thing. Hadn't officially left anyway. It was Volcano was the track. That's the next album. That, that before he left. That's trick of the tale. But it's an interesting point actually. I mean, I'm not not. What happened was that the first album he wrote without Peter um, it was kind of strange that Steve was doing all his solo stuff going to an album. I remember thinking at the time, you know, we need all the songs we can get or the ideas we can get. It's a slight drag. I wasn't angry. It was a slight drag that Steve's got done a solo album, so he's short of ideas. Um, and the first two or three days in the studio in Acton, in the basement as usual, I remember he wasn't there. He was doing, I think, promo for his solo album. And so it was myself, Tony, and, and Phil. And quite a key moment, you know. I remember just, you go in there and you think, Christ, you know, are we going to be okay, you know? It's never a given at any stage in our career. And the first sort of two or three days we wrote, Volcano came out, I think the first day, which was a nice instant, instrumental moment in 7-8. Um, a bit of squonk, not sure what else, but we had some strong stuff before he, he arrived, so kind of odd, really. But it just happened, it turned out that way, you know. And do you think it's, it's right that that kind of, kind of gave you the sense of, oh, Maybe we can do this as a threesome. Yeah, I never thought about it at the time, but I suppose it was funny that that, that, that was a really important moment. You know, had the first three days gone badly, who knows, you know, we might have not proceeded. Um, and it seemed ironic or just strange if he wasn't there for that sort of thing. Um, but maybe it cemented the three-piece sort of feeling. <clears throat> Something that we... Um... I suppose you know, the other thing, was, the other thing actually is that Songs like that, you know, Skonks written on a rhythm guitar riff, like a sort of, and so that's what I do. And the lead stuff is like an arrangement over it, or joins in, you know. And I suppose, and the bass pedals are important too, actually, because you know that uh, volcano, do, 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 do. If I hadn't been able to play that riff, and the pedals as well, we couldn't have done it, you with me, without a fourth person being there. So the pedals gave me a chance to be the bass player and the rhythm player as well, which was probably, maybe we were three and a half people. <laughs> three and a half piece on that day. Oh, I just wanted to ask you about the double neck as well, because this is something that a lot of people are gonna wonder about. Um, it's something that you develop, you decide, and apparently I understand from Darren it's incredibly heavy uh, as a result. But t tell us about it. Why did you decide to put this together? Well, what happened was, in the sort of trespass days, so many songs, so I was really started with an acoustic guitar, and then acoustic guitar and bass pedals, and then a bass, and then a bass pedal and electric guitar. And in that one song, so I was ready, I played about four different sort of parts on the record. So live, the only way to do it was to actually have a, a, a 12 string 
at a pace I couldn't keep going over there, over here, over there. There just wasn't time. And it gave me a chance to sort of do all the parts live up on the record. Um, but I mean, uh, the very first one I had done, I remember going into a guitar maker and laying down a nice 12 string Rickenbacker guitar in one piece, a nice four string Rickenbacker bass in one piece, kind of crossing them over and saying, just cut that, that one there and that one there and join them up. And he laughed, he thought, you're kidding, aren't you? Because for us, the guitar maker, they sort of get the saw out and go, mm, you know, it must have been painful. I've forgotten the guy's name. He's in Woking, actually. I've forgotten the guy's name. But he, he did it, and it kind of worked. Um, and, uh, but it was bloody heavy. You still play it? Yeah, I've got a different one now. But yeah, and then I had a, one for the Lamb, which is a six-string bass, and I'm always ripping my guitar. Um, and it's uh, there's some great sounds coming out of it actually, but it's just uh, it's been a bit of a trademark thing. But it gives you that range to otherwise like cinema show, you know, the first part of the solo. There is no bass. I'm playing a sort of guitar riff on the twelve string bottom strings. Tony's doing his great solo. Phil's drumming. It's a three piece thing. And then at the end, I got a bass. So without that mad changeover. Um, couldn't have done it because it went from one to the other but within like, you know, half a bar. Gave you more range on stage. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's quite an exciting thing for, um, for an audience that is, it's kind of, uh, it's, it's something extra, you know. It's it looks interesting. I see someone playing it and I think, this looks interesting. That's my take on it, yeah. It brings a lot of focus onto you. Mm. Um, Jump ahead, I don't know how much time we've got, and you, you, I know you're doing the sound check, surely. I'm fine to five, I think, yeah. Yeah. Um, Abacab interviewed Hugh Padgham the other day. Um, now, he, my sense is that um, this was a, an important album for the change of, the change of sound, in a way. And I think you said um, in the, when we were talking The Farm that it... It's the first album that made you sound as good as you did when you played live. Is that right? Yeah, I, 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 I stick with that in a sense. You know, it's not belittling people like Dave Henschel and John Burns, but it was hard to. Zeppelin got got, got that feel. They, they recorded in big rooms, you know, in houses. They didn't record in uh, in studios very much, um, especially the drums. Um, yeah, I mean, I hear those early live tapes, you know. Russell tapes or live gig tapes, but it always sounded powerful. The drums sounded powerful. And the record, it all went sort of like, boop, little sounds, you know. And so Hugh came along and just Phil sounded like, like he normally did. Um, we had a sort of a bit more power on record without trying very hard, you know. The sound was there anyway. He just captured it. There's a great, um, but on the, uh Mama, the, the great sound on there of the drums, um, and <clears throat> the fact that it, it, it kind of has a, ref reflects back on uh, Peter's third album. Well, the, yeah, the, I mean, the, uh, the live drum sound was a sound that seemed to, everyone claimed they got it. It's a teamwork. It was Phil, it was Peter, it was Lily White and Peja. Yeah, of course, they're all there. It just happened, I mean, I think. And Peter was saying no symbols, so you could go mad. Um, great sound, you know. Um, and it seemed to come naturally after the, the drum machine intro, which is always an interesting sound. Mama starts, you know. It's an example of how I think an American couldn't, couldn't have done that. I took my Lynn drum machine, put, this, put this, this little drum pattern in, you know, how the song starts into my amplifier, boogie, and turned up so loud, the thing was just shaking on the ground, you know, jumping up and down. Now, an American, you know, so you take a nice sound, and you really fuck it up. Americans find it hard to do that. Sonically, they're too organized, but the English are, are so, so lean that way. But, but the, what was it about Mama that, um made it so, so, such a popular, I mean, the, the sound, 
the way it's constructed. We were playing it with you the other day, and it just, it just sounds... Well, I mean, it's, once again, you see, it's one, of the it's one of the nice things about the Fisher Lane Farmer Studio. We'd always said you want to be able to sort of write and record at the same time. Yeah. And so some of the stuff on, on, on the Mama song came from a longer version, but it came from a, a jam, you know? And some of the stuff on there was how it happened the first day, you know? We did, we did bits, but it's still, that's an example of like, you're kind of writing recording at the same time. The, the hits that followed, um, Hugh worked on uh, Abacab, Genesis, and then um, Visible Touch. Um, we, we, were you aware at the time that there was a, that you were kind of pushing towards a sparer kind of? Well, Abacab was an example of, of yeah. Of, there was a definite conscious effort to try and actually get a slightly pared down sound, um, fill it up less. In a sense, the keyboards often it's easy to fill a sound up with keyboards, and they're still there and they're big, but they're just not. There was more room on the album sonically. Um, and that was, once, once you got that sound in the studio, it sort of was, wasn't hard to recreate. Is there um, a, a, <coughs> it's a, it's a funny thing because Hugh uh, obviously is very excited about the three the three albums he worked on, but then <coughs> let's uh, the dance we can't dance is uh, is almost a step too far for Hugh. It's strange thing because he. He can't quite stand the electronic drums on that. But he didn't like them on when he used to use them. He's he's great on drums. On uh Humber Sea. Electronic drums. He didn't like them then. He never liked them. Uh, but they served a purpose and they sort of fulfilled a role too, I think. Um, Which was? A, a different different feel. Something different. And they were there, it's a new sound, you know. I'm not sure. I mean, Hugh could have done, could have done um, the last, the next album. I'm not sure why he didn't. Uh, it would have been the same, really. It wasn't. We sort of found a sound by then in that room. I think maybe Phil had stopped using him, so maybe we sort of we just sort of just decided it was time for a, a change. I think really. But in a sense, Hugh was an engineer producer, where we'd play the song and the sounds. He'd make, fit them in to make them work. He wasn't a producer who sort of came with ideas about parts, you know. Same as Nick Davis, he's an engineer really, you know, um, who hears the song, hear the parts, hear the bits, record it well, we'll mix it together, you know, make it sound good. But Hugh's skill was by making something small, they found a space on the record. I had a Steinberger bass on that album, and that bass sound was very middly and actually very small, but put it in the track. Because it wasn't anywhere else, it sounded huge. Like Peter Gabriel, P Peter's music is very good. Sonically, he's got a great ear. He'll find, he won't overlap sounds too much. He'll find a space for a sound and a sonic thing. So sometimes this thing about, if every, everything on the album, on the track is big, you hear nothing, because it's just, there's no room. What a defined little areas of sonics. Um, you, the, you weren't renowned for being a quiet band. I mean, the Genesis certainly, up, up to Abacab, was a pretty noisy band. Um, but there's a, is it fair to say that Hugh was very good at kind of atmospheres? Not really. Oh, okay. I mean, no, I mean, he just, whatever, whatever was there, this is the song, isn't it? I'm trying to say, some producers come in and they get involved in the parts and the arrangement. It's more like, got plenty of banks, you know, keyboard overdubs. What are your sounds? What have you got? You know, that sounds nice. You know, it was sort of, um, we can't arrange it ourselves, really. The atmosphere, the atmosphere came from the playing, really. It, it was all getting more difficult. And I think, you know, as the tensions built, people were hanging on 
tighter and making the rules tighter and so the urge to break out and then with the personal stuff um when for me there was very little sympathy and support when you know i was seriously facing losing a child it, that i think was the icing on the cake that sort of closed the door i have to say that, that it, i didn't you know i mean i didn't know I, mean, I wasn't aware of it either. Yeah. I, I had right. my own problems because I had, my marriage had broken up. Had no, you know. Yes. So we're terrible. <laughs> but real terrible. Yeah. Well, I was a bad talkers or bad listeners. Yeah. Well, I don't so. think we kind of thought of it yes, as being true. that for, yeah, much true. in the forefront. Yes, we were certainly. Well, that's part of our upbringing, I think, it doesn't help. But I think just coming back to the writing thing, you've got five people writing in a group and you've got a record coming out maybe once a year or something. There just wasn't enough space. You know, it's, it's a tiny amount of music. So it had to shed somebody, and Peter was the obvious person to go because he had a career he could go to.